This conference uh, will now be recorded. So, Phil, uh, just a few things about you. As a career railway manager with extensive industry knowledge and experience over a range of disciplines, he was appointed uh, head of plan for Babcock Rail in 2011, and he's been responsible for all um, SV Rail JV operational activities for industry customers throughout the network. Um, he previously held the plant engineer role overseeing the introduction of high output equipment to the UK market. Um, he's very experienced in the identification and introduction of new plants and associated deployment methodologies. So it gives me great pleasure, Phil. That was a quick canter through you. Um, quick, <laughs> so now you can turn your camera off and uh, off you go. We look forward to hear what you got to say. Thank you, Brian. I'll spare everybody the pain and uh, stop my camera, yep. Okay, thank you, Brian, um, and thanks for giving SB Rail the opportunity to contribute to this uh, this bulk. Um, there are, I did notice on the screen as well, Michael Zeidler, my colleague in the joint venture, is also participating, so I guess uh, Michael could assist if and when uh, necessary. Uh, I also understand, Kate, you're going to be uh, driving the slides for me, so I get to do my Chris Whitty thing and say next slide, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Kate, yeah, if we can move on, please. Okay, so uh, a few areas to cover. I thought it was worthwhile um, bringing everybody up to speed on uh, SB Rail. The joint venture, um, give a brief history of who we are. Uh, also covering the sort of main topics of COVID-19. So some of the principal areas that we've looked at, uh, we've had to address rather in the joint venture. I mean, communications, quite a lot of operational changes. Um, there's been an awful lot of industry guidance as well that we've tapped into. Uh, we have continued or maintained uh, delivery levels throughout this period, and I'll touch on that. And that all, that's also very nicely led on to some uh, client recognition, which I've, I've also included. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so SB Rail. Um, so probably one of the long, longest standing joint ventures in the industry uh, came together in 2004, uh, principally uh, brought together to look at uh, bringing European best practice into the UK uh, rail market. Um, that actually led on to uh, them securing, uh, the joint venture securing uh, operation and maintenance of network rail or rail track as it was then, their uh, high output equipment, so system two fleet for those that know it. Uh, and that's why the joint venture was originally sort of based in and around Reading and Swindon area. Our, cu our current uh, locations are Glasgow and Manchester, so we've got the uh, parent company motherships in Glasgow. Uh, we've got the, our main sort of south operating base in Manchester. We've also uh, satellite uh, locations as well uh, in York, Reading, and Ashford for the the high speed one works. So um, quite a substantial uh, fleet of on track machines, and they're the majority of which are engaged in the network rail. Uh, on track, on track plant contract, national plant contract. Uh, we're just entering year three of that seven year contract now. Most of that kit is deployed uh, primarily on three um, regions, as we now know. So that, those being Scotland, Eastern, and uh, uh, Northwest and Central. Uh, but we've also got equipment down on high speed one or where we undertake uh, routine tamping campaigns down there. And there's also a major um, package of works that we undertake once a year. In addition to the tamper and regulator fleet, we also have a number of rail cranes and they are routinely deployed for several customers throughout the, the, the network. Um, and again, a um, lot of the equipment that we've introduced is first of type to the UK. So a very strong reputation on the innovation and, and the first type. So that's us in SB Rail. We turn to COVID-19. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, it crept upon us somewhat. Uh, it was uh, it gathered momentum all of a sudden back in early March. 
and we had to arrange ourselves to to address the, the sort of emerging position. So we put together a team uh, in early March to to ensure that we we sent one single consistent message out to the joint venture. That that, that team also reviewed all the um, the sort of the, as I said the emerging position and the guidance that we were receiving. Uh, it's important that we send a single message out and we put in place a weekly brief to all the staff that's pushed out electronically uh, to everyone summarizing the latest position that, in that particular week and that was followed um, on the following day by we introduced an, an open line that anybody could dial into to either clarify the content of that term of the document the brief or raise any other concerns as well that that, that, that they've identified uh, alongside that as well, we put in, in place a site operating rules document, which you see there. Um, and again, that, that covered every uh, activity that we undertake out on site. Uh, obviously, that, that, uh, that was updated as and when new guidance came in. To ensure that we, uh, we, we uh, outlined our position to network rail on readiness, uh, we contributed to a daily update call chaired by network rail uh, as did other otm suppliers and that um that was obviously to ensure that works that were planned were either um, still scheduled for delivery or whether there was any changes that were required and another uh, important issue was obviously close call reporting so we we set the guides we set the um, the brief we sent the brief out uh, and we, we encouraged anybody to report non-compliances with that. And there were a, a number of um, reports issued um, during the early days. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we re they were actioned uh, immediately. And again, that, that sends out the right message to the guys. Thank you. So our um, normal mode, mode of operations needed to change. Uh, to take into account the uh, the social distancing requirements. Probably the main one that we had to look at was uh, when we're tamping SNC. So when we're currently when we're tamping SNC, we have two guys in an operating cab on a tamper that are probably sat a metre, a metre and a half apart, clearly uh, contravening the, the social distancing guidelines. So some of the guys came together and pulled together an operating, a revised operating method, uh, which only, which resulted in only one guy uh, being required to sit in that cab during the uh, the tamping operations. There was also a guy stood outside as well, giving guidance. So quite a major uh, package of work that the guys did there. Uh, we shared it with the industry, and I know it was adopted by by other operators as well. So. We're very proud of that piece of work. Uh, also, when we've undertaken works on site, um, the customer who we're working for, whether it's a renewals contractor or maintenance colleagues, they um, scrutinised the post tamping geometry, and that had previously resulted or required two guys again in the the uh, what we know as the tower cab. Uh, clearly, we we had to put something different in place there, and we agreed a revised method of undertaking that, uh, that analysis as well. Uh, during, uh, before COVID-19, the sort of general uh, methodology was that uh, site staff would travel throughout the work site on the tamper in the cabs. Obviously, we had to do something different there, so we agreed dif uh, different locations on the machine for those guys to, uh, to be located. And also in the cranes, um, when we're deploying the outriggers on the cranes there's quite a substantial pad that we need to position and that's that's quite a intensive manual handling activity um, again we put a revised a revised method in place to uh, to undertake that activity as well during this this uh, position we found ourselves um with limited hotel options available to us because of the geographic coverage of our operations Inevitably, uh, we do use quite a, a number of hotels. That that um, that option reduced down. So therefore, uh, during the the discussions with Network Rail and other customers, 
there was an agreement reached where we would reduce down site times, uh, thus allowing the guys to travel before and after the shift from the home location and stay within the, uh, the 12 hours, the maximum 12 hours. Obviously, we needed uh, PPE out um, to the machines and, and sanitization um, materials. So we put in place uh, a distribution schedule um, to ensure that all the all the machines had the necessary supplies on board. And again, remembering the coverage, we always quote the WIC2 um, Watford area. In truth, it's probably further than that. So quite a large area to keep supplies maintained. Uh, some of the road vehicles, we fit temporary partitions between in the, the front and rear cabins. Again, that, um, that seemed to be a welcome move by the guys. Excuse me. And, uh, and on occasions, we have had guys that, uh, that have um, self-declared symptoms. And therefore, any machines that those guys have been on prior to, to declaring symptoms, we arranged an external company to come in and undertake some, some deep cleaning. Um, some additional actions, we obviously all the guys have uh, competencies to operate and maintain the equipment. We, we were in a position where we couldn't undertake those and therefore following guidance from the ORR, um, we put in place uh, ex extensions to those competencies. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but we're now in a position where we're actually addressing that, that backlog that's built up. But early doors, we, we risk assessed the position and extended the core competencies. Also received guidance from Sentinel, as did the rest of the industry, uh, granting a form of extension to existing co Sentinel competence. Um, routine medicals, uh, we were struggling to get medicals uh, undertaken. And again, the ORR sent some good guidance out on that allowing us to put in place uh, measures for, for example, self-declarations on, uh, on staff uh, medical status. And uh, we implemented that for the, for the train drivers that we have in the teams. Um, we, again, uh, the statutory inspections, some of the companies that we use, the external companies uh, for the crane examinations, for example, or the ultrasonic axle testing, uh, we couldn't access that, those suppliers and therefore we deferred some of those, um, those activities, again, based on uh, historic evidence. Um, and again, it's in the supply chain, uh, there was a number of our key suppliers uh, shut up shop and they were no longer available. And we put in place alternative options for the supply of some of our key uh, components. So delivery, uh, quite surprisingly, the, the uh, initial indication was that there was going to be no downturn in delivery demand. That was, that was at the, within the first couple of days of lockdown. Uh, it's business as usual, guys, uh, continue putting in place measures to, to achieve that. Um, alongside that, the, our client put in place uh, temporary changes to the contract clauses. And that's, that's, um, that was on, on the performance side. So if we, for whatever reason, were unable to achieve delivery, there was a recognition there that it was obviously uh, related to COVID-19. So that was very welcome, as you might imagine. <coughs> All SP Rail staff were identified as critical workers, allowing us to obviously travel around the country undertaking the, uh, the work and um, getting access to hotel accommodation because that a lot of the available accommodation was only available for critical workers. Again, lots of collaboration throughout the OTM community. It was a pleasure to, or has been a pleasure to witness and continues to be so, uh, on best practice methodology, on sharing of spare parts, uh, and and quite a lot of other uh, and a lot of other stuff. And the good news is that we've continued to live, deliver uh, and then uh, achieve performance in line with pre-COVID levels. 
that has nicely led to a lot of recognition from the client, which I've included uh, in the slide pack there. So from our three principal operating routes, um, we had some very nice praise through from, from the guys across there. That has uh, found its way to the delivery teams, the guys out in the field, and it's very much appreciated and certainly uh, gives the guys a, a boost when we, when we receive communication such as this. <coughs> and that, ladies and gents, was all I had to say today. Okay, uh, well, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was that was really good. Um, we uh, we're running slightly ahead of uh, time here, so uh, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. We've got a, we've got a, a one question. So, Andy, do you want to just uh, give give Phil the first question, please? You might as well take this at the end of this presentation, so we all we're in tune with what we're we're talking about here. Do you want to take okay, us through that? Okay, there's just one question from Phil. Um, if, if there is now one man outside the cab during the tamping operation, what is your opinion? Is it actually a worse situation overall because the man outside is less likely to catch yeah. TV, or is in danger from the moving machinery? Yeah, it's it's a good point, Andy. We, we obviously uh, recognise that in the risk assessment. Um, and... The site specific is, is the the honest answer, Andy. Um, obviously, if, if we're on the embankment, then the risk is far greater than a nice flat straight piece of track. Um, but again, control measures in place. He is in constant communication with the uh, with the operators on board the machine. Um, I think uh, I think he, he is in a safe position, Andy. Otherwise, we wouldn't have implemented this revised method of working. Nor would the would the wider community, to be honest. Thanks very much for that. That was actually from Michael James, the question. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Okay, if anybody's got any other questions, um, I've got a question for you um, that, uh, well, I, I just want to say that, sorry, probably two people arrived a little bit later. I'm delighted. It's Brian Counter speaking here. Uh, chair in the session. I'm delighted that we've got uh, 39 people here. So welcome to everybody. It just shows the interest that we've had in all this stuff. Um, and as I say, if you if you're late coming in, just a quick one to say that the presentations for the last two are available on the PWI website. So please have a look at those because we've got different organisations, the different companies, and it's a good way of sharing best practice. So. Please have a look at those. Uh, I've just got one one question. I think you've alluded to this in your presentation, Phil, and it was to do with productivity. Really, have you been have you been managing to do the same amount of work in in similar possession times with the under the new arrangements? Yes. So again, uh, so plain line tamping, Brian. No noticeable uh, reduction in volume. Uh, SNC tamping, it does take slightly longer to tamp through complex SNC with the revised working methodology, um, but, but no, no significant reduction. Just as a follow up on that, um, obviously it took a while, and uh, I'm really impressed by the way everybody's been working together, and it seems like there's been an amazing amount of industry collaboration on getting things into place. It obviously took a while to get things into place. Did you lose a lot of shifts while that happened? We were very fortunate, Brian, that we were relatively unaffected compared to other operators. Uh, and therefore, no, the, the reduction in volume was uh, not noticeable. Uh, in fact, Michael might put me right, who's also on the call, but I don't think we lost a, an OTN shift. Um, as a result of the position we found ourselves in with COVID-19. Mm. No, that, that, that's really good. Uh, Andy, I think we've got one more question we can just take before we move on. Yeah, it's just one more from Steve Featherston, which uh, it's got nothing to do with COVID, but what is the latest on the 09 4x4 stroke 4S? 
how is it be received by clients and what is the order book looking like thanks steve um yeah excellent uh, feedback we've we've just uh, with the first or rather the third sp rail 094s has been in service now since week one uh, some good good performance output from that the fourth 094s is if it isn't already here it's certainly on route from austria it arrived this morning in west Ely. Ah, there we are bang on bang hot, on time just as hot off the press table. Yep. Yep. perfect so that was michael advising the the fourth yep. 09 is is here uh we've got a period of fitting the uk equipment on board it and then it will be in service at the end of june machines five and six undergoing manufacture still in austria so so that begs me a little question because um, we're all into tampers and there's lots of people listening here 39 of us and quite a few of us probably don't realize what the difference is between this new tamper and the previous one so what are the advantages then phil of the of the of the new machine okay so the, the machine you see there on the screen the the 4x4 4s four, um that is as it said their dynamic machine so it's a continuous action tamper the blue uh, assembly you see there is a satellite so that's the that's the part of the machine that that stops tamps and moves forward the main body of the machine is is continually moving throughout the work site so therefore the outputs are greater uh, also on these machines they have the dts units dynamic track stabilizer and that uh, allows um the customer to um increase the line speed handback or achieve line speed handback if, it, if, if i must say so lots of benefits also on the recording system uh for the various geometry that we achieve uh we probably haven't got enough time brian for me to go through the whole list <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no it, it's it, i think we're, we're all back into sort of uh excitement and looking forward to the future yeah. And we've made such main strides in this sort of area as an industry. It's fabulous, and it's it's good that Steve's Steve's watching, and that, that's excellent. Um, so, if there's any time at the end, uh, Phil, we we've got a little bit of time for question and answers at the end. So, if anybody's got any other questions they want to put you on the technical side, then we can have a crack at those as well as the stuff that we're dealing with on the COVID side. So, in the meantime, Phil, thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated. Um, thank, you, thank you for your presentation and uh, it's good to see what what's been happening within within SB rail that's excellent so I, w I'm going to move on to our next speaker and uh, and this is uh, Dominic Truman from TFL um, so uh, Dominic's just appeared there with his with his new haircut so uh, now I'm, I'm only jealous Dominic because obviously you know I, I, I uh, yeah, I could do with. I definitely could do with a haircut myself, as you can probably see. Uh, um, so I think Kate needs to take away the other one, and then you can upload. No, it's yeah, just I'll... a case for Dominic to share. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. So I didn't realise you had to take that one away. So if, if Dominic, you would uh, just like to upload yours, that'd be excellent. Uh, and then I can do the introductions. There we go. People. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, yeah, just introducing Dominic. Um, he, he's no stranger to the PWI. He's uh, presented an, on a number of occasions and uh, more recently at the technical board earlier on this year. So uh, it's, it's good to hear what's going on in, in this role. He's a chartered mechanical engineer with 10 years of row engineer experience. Um, he joined Metronet in as a graduate engineer in 2007 and uh, in his early days he did a lot on rail defect management and he was a lead in that and he was very successful in that role because he got a 50 percent reduction in emergency rail defects between 2014 and 2018 no mean feat in in a complex system like tfl um he also did a lot on rail noise and i remember watching one of his presentations at london transport museum a while ago uh, especially with the introduction of night tube um, he's now taken over the, a new and challenging role with uh, 
as track manager of London Trams, uh, which is which is uh, he's going to talk us about how, how they've dealt with the COVID situation here. Um, and obviously, in terms of professional registration, it's great to see that he's keeping uh, involved in professional institutions, and he's been doing. Uh, he's been the lead sponsor for mechanical engineering graduates at TFL. So, Dominic, uh, we look forward to your presentation. And you can turn your camera off now and I'll turn mine off and uh, we'll start. If anybody's got any questions for Dominic, as we've said, if you've just recently joined, please use the chat facility uh, and then Andy, Steele or I will, will talk you through the questions. And it's over to you, Dominic. Thank you very much for helping us out today. No worries. No, my pleasure. It's, uh, it's good to talk about trams. Uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, so... I'm just going to uh, give a quick introduction of, of the tram network. Uh, Brian gave a good introduction on myself. I don't think I need to do that. Uh, an overview of the, the network. And then I'll quickly go on to the sort of challenges we faced with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, and the lockdown, the PPE challenges we had, and then, then just some other things uh, regarding that. Uh, so, the network is is 28k that, that's end to end sort of the track length is around double that although we do have quite a lot of single track sections uh and we've got we've got two different fleet uh a, a bombardier and also a, a stadler if you want to i could bore you to tears about the wheel rail interface differences between them uh but that's not for now uh and uh 31 million passengers per year but I sus suspect that will change quite dramatically after after what just happened. Uh, so here's a network. Uh, but the reason I like to show the diagram is just because I know a lot of people might be not be aware even of London trams. And when they think of tram network, they think of uh, groove rail and embedded rail sections and trams going through streets. If you just look at the sort of loop uh, between sort of West Croydon and East Croydon in the middle of that, that loop is our only uh, embedded rail section. It actually does go out to the Sanderlands uh, there, but that loop and down to Sanderlands towards the right are the only embedded track sections we have on, on the network. The rest is, is ballasted track. And so a lot of the issues that affect mainline railways, we have the same issues and we require the same maintenance. Um, that's so uh, just a Harry Beck version. Again, you can see the the loop and down to Sunderlands. That that's uh, that's just our embedded track section. The rest is is ballasted. So uh, the, the the permanent way team uh, is it sits under this sort of infrastructure team. It's it's qu quite small, I think, for maintaining uh, a network of this size. So it's one track manager, which myself. I've got a track engineering technician. Uh, he does a lot of the the analysis and uh, and planning of our works. We then have two track supervisors, What one works days, the other works nights. Then we just have four track technicians uh, to do the work. We, have, we normally have a breakdown of two staff on days and then we have the rest on nights. Uh, and we have one MPL, sorry, that's a non-permanent labour, so uh, it's contract, uh, but he's, he's sort of a semi-permanent contract who's been with us uh, for some time. Uh, so, so it's a, it's a very small team, and as I go on, when you you know staff sickness does does have some quite big implications. Uh, just the challenges we have, you know, not when there's a pandemic on, is that uh, one of the big surprises of me is the points mechanisms are maintained by P way and not by a systems or signalling team. Uh, reason for that is a lot of them are sprung point mechanisms just for the uh, the uh, dual to uh, single line running uh, and so it's a it's a wholly mechanical device and so that's why the p-way team do it uh for a mechanical engineer for myself that's quite good though uh i know uh, track engineering can get a bit civilly at times so maintaining the points mechanism at least is some real real mechanical engineering uh managing defective rails in town centers and uh that's quite a challenge because the cost of re-railing and, and the complexity of removing rail in in which is encased in concrete is very difficult so on, on most of the cases we actually just have quite serious defects but because they're encased we don't do anything with them which uh, the, yeah, yeah 
interesting situation. Uh, as I've said, the cost and complexity of renewing town centre track is it's sort of on a par with, with doing deep tube renewals and, and, and we don't have the same sort of budget that London Underground have for their, for their track renewals. So that, that's a real challenge for us. Uh, we, we have unusual components. I say we've got ballasted track. It's ballasted track with, on the whole, 49E1 rail rather than rather than 56. So, so that's, that's difficulty when it comes to just sort of clips and just generally getting rail. Uh, there, there is a lack of standards. It's sort of, it falls between this strange place of not quite a railway but we're not running buses so it's it's a di that's a difficult uh complexity uh and as i've mentioned a, a small team so i'll i'll go on to uh to managing with covid uh so the tram service was reduced to sunday service all week so that's the trams running about every 10 to 15 minutes uh a lot of that was driven by our operator, which is uh, Tram Operations Limited, they're part of First Group, uh, and and getting their staff availability and getting the trams out. Uh, all major infrastructure projects were stood down, and that, that did have an implication as us because we we had some track renewals, some required track renewals, especially prior to hot weather, which we have now. So I'm nervously looking at our rail temperatures. Uh, was delayed. Uh, they're looking like they will go ahead now after summer, so that that's good that they're they're not they haven't been uh, completely uh, cancelled, but their deferral did have implications to us. And one of the big implications was that uh, I think it was prior to the TfL getting a government bailout, uh, a number of staff were were furloughed, uh, and especially in the projects and also the admin teams and and as sort of as a track manager, we're like quite quite. Heavily on your sort of finance and admin teams, even for simple things such as staff vehicles and and uh, fuel cards and, and and sort of they seem quite minor, but but when when the staff are furloughed, it, it creates quite a headache for you as a track manager, and that that workload definitely did increase, and I think that's something we need to to learn from. Should we ever have a, a similar situation? Uh, so so challenges specifically for for me is is the small team. So as you saw, we had. Uh, we had seven uh, track staff, uh, and and at the start we had we had family self and uh, family isolations. The family isolation the most difficult one was that was fourteen days. So we're out staff for for fourteen days, and and that's a that's a large percentage of the team. Uh, and at the start of the outbreak, we were down two staff, uh, meaning that we had five staff doing the total maintenance and. And additional issue was we could have looked at the option of bringing in more non-permanent labour, but there was definite nervousness to bringing in new staff onto the network for for the infection risk. So uh, speaking with speaking with the team, they, they were reluctant to to have you know new staff contractors, potentially different contractors coming in. So we we made did with five at the time, uh, which was challenging, uh, but. But we managed it. Fortunately, most cancelled their leave because you know annual leave isn't quite the same under under lockdown. Uh, so we were able to get by, but that that was a definite challenge, and we were nervous if 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 one more staff had had to isolate for be it their family or their uh, their self, then then we would have had to look at either derogating our uh, our maintenance tasks or bringing in contract labour. But both would have been difficult. And I'll come back to derogations uh, later. Uh, so there you'll see is all our all our maintenance tasks. Uh, so I will, I will come back to that. But you see, we've got some quite uh, frequent one. We're doing, we're visually patrolling every couple of weeks. We're doing we're actually looking at our points weekly. We're doing it weekly points inspections. It's mainly driven by uh, by reliability, especially embedded points cleaning. One of the big issues with the tramway is that uh, you get a lot of rubbish and detritus from from just a town centre ending up in the points and the points mechanism. So cleaning them weekly is a, is a critical task. So you see, with this small team, we do have to ca carry out very regular tasks. Uh, you also see the ultrasonic rail detection and, and geometry inspections. 
unfortunately, a lot of them didn't fall down, fall in the period where we had lockdown, but ultrasonic rail testing did. We were able to carry that out uh, with a, a two meter uh, social distancing with them and the protection staff. So, so that worked uh, okay. Uh, so, so th these were our policies at the start was that we, we would not change our maintenance schedule initially. What, whilst we still had a sort of quorum of staff, we, we carried on with our, our maintenance schedule. Uh, we did weekly PP orders and stock checks uh, and we had a strict rule that no PP, no work. So it really put responsibility on us as us as managers to to ensure that the staff had the correct PPE. And I've got to praise our uh, our stores team uh, did a great job at managing to to supply that. Uh, one of the big issues was gloves uh, because for P-way tasks, you often need gloves, especially lubricating maintenance. It's greasy, dirty, and the staff require gloves. However, there was then a big demand for pretty much everyone else to have gloves as well. And so getting gloves for our tasks was quite difficult. And there are a few heated scenes in the depot, uh, I think between between Fleet and uh, and our team, uh, because of who, who the glove delivery was actually for. But fortunately, we've, we've managed to resolve those issues and everyone has enough gloves to to work. Uh, we also changed that staff staff just go to site. Previously, they would meet at the uh, the depot and uh, and discuss the shifts, plan it, and go and then go on to site from there. The, guy, the guys have their own vans uh, which they take home. So the, the rule was we go straight to site uh, wherever possible to reduce the infection risk. Uh, emphasis on hand hygiene and, and distancing. Uh, and, and only critical tasks which require staff to be within two metres were carried out. Uh, and I'll, I'll go on to that. Uh, so but this is just an example of the, uh, and this again, I've praised the stores team, they created this form uh, for us. We fill it in every week, send it to our stores team and, and they're providing those uh, that PPE and, and the system is working, working very well within trams. And uh, as I said, it was a bit, uh, testing at the start but now it's working very well the system and we're, we're going to continue this uh, and also just you know here's a here's a log of the usage so but this what this allowed us to have a look at is is because there was an element of panic buying at the start is what you know what are stocks what are we actually using so we can we can tailor our order a bit better so ensuring we get the right right amount in uh, we listed out all the uh, all the tasks, and I've done it for the whole works team here, but you can see the top two are off the track is uh, is the number of, uh, is, a, is the shifts that required staff to be within two meters. We couldn't carry out lubricator maintenance wherever possible with distance, but there are tasks where you need the two guys to be within two meters. So so we just listed them so, so we're aware of them and the guys have the correct PP to do those tasks. We we have drafted derogations uh, based on the, the ORR guidance to to derogate against certain maintenance tasks uh, if we had a significant staff shortage. Uh, currently, we haven't had that. As I said, we got down to five, but we didn't have got any uh, lower. It was risk assessed. So uh, you saw, for example, the weekly points maintenance because that's a reliability driven thing. That's mainly about cleaning the, cleaning and oiling the slide chairs. That would be a task that would be would be extended, and we wouldn't do it weekly. We would run the risk of additional uh, additional callouts, perhaps because of reliability issues, and tram reliability may suffer. But it wasn't. It wouldn't be risk. It would be risk based, and we wouldn't be putting a risk on the railway, unlike our safety critical patrols. So, so that's it. Uh, I, I I feel we we cope quite well. I I think possibly being a small team has. Uh, has has helped us. I, uh, being critical workers allowed allowed the sort of childcare issues to be resolved, and also the fact that a majority of the work is nights has also helped uh, helped the guys with families uh, to do that. So I, I do think on trams we, we've managed quite well. Uh, reliability has actually probably been better than it's ever been. I think that's partly due to reduced service and reduced usage of uh, of the tram network. Uh, but yeah, we're carrying on going, and hopefully, hopefully the projects will uh, 
will start up later this summer. So uh, yeah, hope that helps and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Okay, just uh, put my camera on. Um, thank you very much, Tommy. I much, much appreciated that. Was uh, that was really helpful. Um, I, I, just a question from me while Andy's looking at see if we've got any from elsewhere. Um, I take it obviously it, uh, the tram system down at uh, Croydon uh, runs as an independent sort of system. Did you follow sort of sort of TFL COVID guidelines? that were sort of set by the centre, or did you just do your own thing on the trams? <laughs> yeah, it's a, we're sort of, uh, we're in a, we are TFL, we're very much TFL, but it has been a sort of recent development that we, that especially the infrastructure maintenance has come within within TFL, so that there is a sort of culture of wanting to do the own thing, but but we, we do have to follow uh, TFL guidance, uh, which we did, uh, but a lot of TFL guidance was regarding their operational staff for the sort of more more unionised areas. So, uh, so we didn't really have uh, too much of the the sort of yeah. Uh, what would I say? We didn't have too much of the guidance, which we, which created a headache for us. The only one was regarding face masks. But we were already on top of that with our PPE order, so so we were quite we were quite comfortable then. Okay, thank you. I think Andy's got something to say. Yeah, they've got a, a question from Greg Strong. Um, have there been oh. any changes? Have there been any changes to work in practice um, for COVID that you will look to retain, or any potential efficiencies, um, e.g., when determining what activities are critical? Yeah. Well, firstly, uh, hi, Greg. Uh, and uh, and personally, I, I'm. I, I'm quite in favour of uh, the going to site. Uh, I think, I, especially with a, a small team, that uh, fatigue has been an issue with us, and we've had a number of fatigue studies uh, to ensure our staff aren't aren't overworking. And and at TfL, there's been a real push for for what, what's titled smart working, which is is you know working from home. It's, it's mainly driven at office staff, but I think the same can go for for the, the, the staff on on site. Uh, and I think if they've got their vans, they can go straight to site. It means that their shift hours can be can be less because they haven't got the additional travel, uh, and I just I just feel that yeah they they can often get home a bit quicker. I I just feel that that's a, hasn't hasn't harmed us in any way. So I, I wouldn't see why we wouldn't continue with that. Uh, regarding the any sort of interval changes that we looked at, uh, it we didn't have enough time and analysis to to fully go through that it was the derogations would have been simply based on the fact that we didn't have enough staff rather than any sort of safety argument so i think if we were going to do that we'd need a lot more time and detailed thought i think andy i think you've got another question for us as well yeah, the, the, um, <laughs> got steve featherston question are you aware yet of the medium uh, to long-term implications of the cash shortfalls in TfL and what this may mean for the permanent way? No, uh, really. We've, we've got the government bailout, which I think is 1.6 billion. Uh, that's that's uh, that's sort of only only short term, relatively short term, and and I think long term our ridership will be significantly down. Uh, we have secured sort of the naught to two year uh, funding i think has been uh, been agreed so i think i think projects within that within that range will some will go ahead some won't but i think that that's relatively okay i think long term i don't know because i, I do think yeah as you know the, the level of income that tfl as a, as a whole will have will be will be greatly reduced and uh, and probably for a long term so i i don't know i don't know i i think but plug trams, I think they could possibly learn a lot of trams because we have been running with a very lean team and it shows you can operate, or admittedly not the same sort of tonnages that other networks have, but we can run a team on a on a relatively small team. So maybe you can learn from trams a bit. Mm. Have you got any other questions, Andy, coming through? I've, I've, uh, I've got one. I mean, I've, um, I'm interested, uh, Dominic, just to how resilient uh, Croydon tram, uh, Croydon tram, London tram is, um, with that few staff maintaining the permanent way. 
Um, uh, check, yeah, not maybe. not very at all. Not not very at all. And, and actually, we we were due to we had a review done regarding fatigue and and our resilience to get additional additional staff in, which we are now progressing with, but was obviously put on hold during COVID. So it's been recognised that that we are running too lean uh, in terms of our resilience and and ability to if if you know. It's always difficult around summer with with annual leave, uh, and it's, it needs to be very carefully managed. So, uh, so yeah, more staff are required and, and are being hired. Okay. okay, Dominic. Well, thank you very much. I hope you'll hang around just at the end, please. And uh, yeah, obviously, we we'll, you know we we just had a little bit of time there to take some questions, and uh, we're happy for people to think of any other questions and. You know, while we're here and we're all enjoying um, the presentations, it's just useful to just widen out the, the questions around something that you may want to know about our, our speakers' organisations. And it's just really good, um, in my view, to look at innovations because one thing I, I think about the railway industry is that it always seems to you know, step up to the plate when it comes to dealing with a problem. And I know we've had our series of problems and issues over many many decades and as a rail industry we can pull together and get it to work again and it's, it's amazing and um, one of the things that I've been really impressed with um, has been the ability to cope through this crisis uh, but and it just proves to me that you know we do have a long way to go in, in innovation and I think a lot of a lot of us in the PWI you know are very keen to to talk to create that arrangement where people can communicate benefits of innovation. So perhaps we can use that as a bit of a catalyst when we finish the next presentation. So if you can be thinking about a couple of questions there, you know, if we can, if we can solve these problems well and we can use some of the great things that we've learned in the last few weeks, what can we bring forward in the future? So I'll just sort of pose those for you for the end session and while we've got three great speakers here that would be excellent okay dominic well thank you very much indeed we're bang on time and i'll hand over to our third speaker uh which hopefully is john and uh, we hope to be able to see him and, and get him to upload his stuff yep have you seen my screen now we can see you, John, with those famous headphones that uh, are quite, <laughs> like quite impressive. Quite, I, I'm just jealous of your headphones, you see, because they're just incredible. So uh, if you want, yeah, just, just put it onto screen, put it onto um, slideshow for the first slide. I'll just go to... If you just press, that will be fine. To come through is it is it not oh the, the, i think are we there let's just leave that for a second i'll just introduce you because i think we need we need to go on to a different version of that one but just leave that for a minute let's uh sort that out in one second let's just talk about you first uh interesting um it's great that we've got you here john this is john austin from British Steel, and I didn't know much about what's happening in British Steel. I glanced at his slides, and it seems to me that uh, British Steel is uh, thriving. They've got new owners, and it's good to see they're providing the sort of services that we need across this country. And uh, John's the perfect expert on this because he joined British Steel in 1993 as a trainee. He's held a number of positions before joining the commercial team in 1999 and he's now with all these years experience commercial manager for, for, manager for British Steel's rail business responsible for the UK and Irish markets and the supply of rail and steel sleepers he's made a, he's, he's currently playing a key role in the transformation of British Steel Steel's rail business to grow the sales worldwide he holds a, a, an ILM level five in leadership and management and we're delighted uh, John that you've managed to join us today and, and, and put the sort of presentation together which we hopefully share 
with a lot of people because we talk, we don't often get to hear about uh, what's happening in the sort of manufacturing type of process as a key part of our supply chain. So over yeah. to you, John. Okay. I'm just having trouble get rid of my notes at the minute. So um, that's all right. Okay. You, you can do another view. Right? You're, on, you're in presenter view at the moment on your on your PowerPoint. So whether you can go into a different view rather than presenter view. Let's just try that works. No, that's not working. Depends on not the type good. of PowerPoint you've got. Can you help Kate or do you understand what he's trying to do? Yeah, I, this is the online version of PowerPoint. I'm afraid I'm not sure how it works, but um, we can see we can see the slide, uh, and once your videos are hidden, it will increase the size. So I'd suggest perhaps not worrying about it too much and okay. moving. Let's let's carry on then, John. We can see we can see the main slides anyway. It's just that we can all read your notes as well, which is <laughs> great. You see, you can just go to sleep and we'll just read it. No, it's fine. You carry on. Great to see you, John. Um, and if you want to carry on, thank you. Hello. I can hear you. Can you still see my slides? I just had a message saying it, you couldn't see my slides anymore. No, we can see the slides. That's fine. Oh, right, okay. carry right. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. I'll carry on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the final talk of today's session. Uh, my name is John Austin, and I'm the commercial manager of the rail business for British Steel. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some of the practical solutions as we as a business, like many others, have had to implement to ensure the protection of our employees. But I'm also going to talk about how, as a company, we monitor the wider picture and effects of COVID-19 to ensure continuity of supply to our key customers. So first of all, I'd like to provide a brief business update on British Steel, as there's been a lot of media speculation uh, regarding us over the last 12 months or so. Uh, on 22nd of May 2019, British Steel was placed into compulsory liquidation. Um, supported by the UK government and official receivers, the business kept running as normal whilst maintaining production outputs. A continuous commitment to purchase raw materials, which are sourced from all corners of the world uh, on long lead times, ensured a viable business was available for any new prospective buyers. These were difficult times for everybody involved, not just employees, but customers, suppliers, and the heart of the um, and, and the local communities. The steelworks in the UK are at the heart of the local communities. So whilst 4,000 direct jobs were potentially at risk, an estimated wider supply chain of 20,000 jobs were also thought to be at risk. A special thanks must also go to British Steel's customers who've supported us through this difficult period and in particular for the rail business, the continued support from key customers like Network Rail and Transport for London is gratefully appreciated. I'm pleased to say that the process ended successfully with the sale of the business to the Chinese steel giants Jingye Steel. Jingye's vision is, is to expand their business through international growth and British Steel's products are complementary to their existing product portfolio. The sale included all of the UK assets, which are mainly based in Scunthorpe, Teesside and Skin and Grove, and also the European wire rod business based in Holland. Jingye's plan is to invest into the manufacturing operations with an exciting commitment to spend over £1 billion over the next five year period. Jingye have had a team of over 40 employees from China working alongside the workforce in Scunthorpe for many months now to learn from each other and share best practices. So Jingye's rise to success is an impressive story. Their first blast furnace was built in 94, and now they have 18 operational furnaces. Jingye is a family-run business, now employing over 23,000 people and generating a revenue of over 10 billion pounds per year. Jingye Group prides itself on environmental protection through energy saving technologies and a strong focus on recycling. So British Steel site in Scunthorpe is an integrated steelworks, which means it produces all of its steel products from raw materials. British Steel has four main product lines. So starting from the right hand side 
It has two wire rod mills, one based in Scunthorpe and one based in Al Blasadam, Holland. Both mills produce high quality wire rod for the automotive construction and engineering markets. The next product line is what we refer to as special profiles. So based in Skinner Grove in the northeast of England, this mill produces a range of products mainly focused on the yellow goods markets. So its key customers are the likes of Caterpillar and JCB. The construction business produces structural steel sections from two mills, one based in Scunthorpe and the other based in Teesside. Predominantly used in the construction sector for the likes of buildings or stations, we also see these products being used in the masts and catenaries used in overhead electrification of the railway. And finally, the rail business. The British Steel has been producing steel railway rails for over 140 years, supplying 95% of the UK rail demand to both network rail and transport for London, British Steel really is at the heart of Britain's railways. Whilst the main operations of British Steel are based in the UK, we do have manufacturing sites, service centres and the sales office throughout the world. Local guidelines and restrictions had to be considered for any of the British Steel staff working in these locations with regards to COVID-19. The production of steel is a complicated process and has the potential to be extremely dangerous. This is why the site in Scunthorpe is a tier one coma site, which stands for control of major accidents and hazards. The Scunthorpe site is strictly regulated under the coma regulations, and we have to manage our activities in a way which reduces risks to the workers and the public. This is achieved through appropriate plant design, process control, mitigation measures, and emergency procedures. So what does COVID-19 mean for a tier one coma site? It was clear from the early days of this outbreak that continue, continuity of supply of key products to the railway industry must continue. As a key supplier to the likes of Network Rail and Transport for London, we needed to ensure there were no impacts to supply. Key to the operation of our site is people. Our highly skilled staff ensure safe operations 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It was clear from an early stage when the COVID-19 pandemic started to affect the UK, one of the busy, biggest risks to business was the ability of employees to carry out their duties by safely attending their workplace. As the steelworks in Scunthorpe is an integrated site, a lot of operational areas rely on the other areas working as planned. If money levels were to fall below critical levels in particular areas, this could enforce shut down plant and equipment, which has the potential to stop delivery of key products. So we needed to monitor the effect of those employees unable to work due to having to self-isolate. And starting on the 17th of March, we tracked not just the overall number of employees affected, but more importantly, the different areas in where they worked. The map shows the different areas on the site on the Scunthorpe Works. So we closely monitored the number of employees affected in each of the different relevant areas. The red circles show the number of people at a point in time who are having to self-isolate, unable, uh, unable to attend work. Probably the most important building on British Steel's site in Scunthorpe is our dedicated medical centre, home to our occupational health team. A small team of six employees and six contractors providing dedicated on-site medical care. By following UK government guidelines, the key role for the occupational health team has been to provide support to the British Steel workforce, including the monitoring of employees who are self-isolating and ensuring they can return to work as soon as possible when safe to do so. Where necessary, the team can provide a focal point for employees who may require mental health support.
looking okay, John? Sorry, can you can you hear me again? Yes, you're back with us. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We can hear you. We lost you um, for about a minute or so, but. I do apologise. My uh, my home Wi-Fi seems to have uh, <laughs> let me down. I'm afraid. Don't worry. These things uh, happen. That's okay. Right. Okay. Um, I think I've got, I'm not sure where we got to with that one, but I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll skip on to the next one. Uh, so as I said earlier, the continuing to to supply key customers was one of the main objectives during the peak of the pandemic. Understanding customer demand is crucial in keeping British Steel operational. We work in a number of markets supplying many different products, not just the UK and Europe, but all over the world. During the early stages of COVID-19 crisis, the role of the commercial teams was to provide daily updates on how customers and British Steel supply chain were being affected. The demand plan, which is a central tool that drives the business, was monitored through a daily governance process and led by the executive team. The daily governance meetings reported and discussed on customers, mark, customers, markets, transportation and supply chains to identify areas of issue and give them a red, amber, green status. The slide shows an example of what was being monitored and discussed. Throughout this period, it has demonstrated the need for clear communication with key, st key stakeholders even more than ever. The ability to provide updates to stakeholders and listen to their issues or concerns is key to making informed decisions. For the rail business, we held a number of conversations with customers to develop high, medium, and low supply scenarios, but this really was a crystal ball moment, and the only way to manage the situation was with constant reviews. Another measure we found useful was the monitoring of other steel producers throughout Europe. Not all of these, these steel producers on the map are direct competitors of British Steel, but it was useful to understand how COVID was having an effect on their similar operations. By monitoring how other steel mills were affected, allowed a picture to be created, which was used as a decision-making tool as how British Steel would react to closures and restrictions. This was recorded and monitored on a daily basis to help make informed decisions. Communications with customers is always important, but during the peak of the pandemic, daily communications were necessary to keep monitoring the situation. As an example from uh, one of our uh, from our wire rod business, one of British Steel's customers, Schaefer, was wanting to reopen its operations after furloughing its plant for a period of time. The customer wanted to ensure it was the right decision to reopen their facilities, so as part of the process, British Steel worked in partnership to provide sufficient confidence that supply of products would be able to be resumed whilst adhering to the best practice measures they were putting in place. Communications with customers are now returning to back to more normal levels, which is hopefully a positive sign. Moving forward to on to more of the specific details in relation to COVID. Whilst we were learning to adopt the new way of working, British Steel engaged with UK Steel, who represent all steel companies in the UK, and Bayes to share best practices to input into the steel sector guidelines. These guidelines cover numerous areas as detailed on the slides. As a business, we've tried to use information from many different sources, even if the guidelines are focused on an industry dissimilar to ours. One of the main reasons the PWI held these sessions was to understand how different, different businesses have reacted to the COVID situation and how this information can be shared with their members. I think it's important that all information is shared and readily, readily available for everybody. The UK Steel Guidelines are free and available for downloading for anybody who would like a copy. In terms of some of the practical measures we put in place in our sites, um, these are very similar to what was being presented before. And I don't think it's a bad thing to repeat what others have previously shared. I take it as a positive, we are all implementing the correct necessary precautions. Throughout the sites, we have a number of control rooms or pulpits where one of the, more than one employee must work together. Social, social distancing measures have been put in place where possible. But if employees cannot work alone, the use of face masks must be adhered to and extra cleaning of the working stations is carried out. Exclusion zones have been put in place within office and reception areas and hand sanitizers are in place for employees and visitors entering buildings. Anybody wanting to visit or drive on our sites must go through a safety induction, 
we receive drivers coming to collect goods from all European countries on a daily basis. The induction centre has been modified to ensure a two metre distance is maintained whilst carrying out their induction. The majority of the office space staff at British Steel were instructed to work from home prior to the national lockdown. There are a small number of staff that must attend the office to oversee the, to oversee the operations. The current numbers attending work means that social distancing can be easily accommodated. We are working towards how the return of office space staff can be managed once any relaxations in the rule over home working are announced. Restrictions of where people can sit within offices are being reviewed and the tape is being used to easily identify how many people can work in a particular area. Hand sanitizer stations and COVID-19 guidelines have been added to any clocking in and frequently used areas. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the operations of the main steelworks has continued. We did furlough, furlough the plant at Skinny Grove and one of the distribution centres in, in Lisbon Island, but this was only for a three week period before they reopened. Jingye has demonstrated its clear drive and commitment throughout this period of uncertainty. Individual care packs have been provided for the employees who have continued to attend their workplace. Jingye has also donated critical PPE to the health and care workers in the North Lincolnshire and across the Tees Valley. Jingye and British Steel will continue to follow and share best practices whilst we work towards returning to some sort of normality. So how are we going to manage the situation going forward? Our comprehensive risk assessment matrix specially created for COVID-19 will continuously be re reviewed and revised while government guidelines are updated. We will continue to monitor and focus our operations with key stakeholders. Most importantly, we have pledged to ensure the maximum protection and safe working of our workforce, visitors and local community. Uh, that's the end of my, my presentation. I would just like to say thank you to the Pernet Way Institution for giving us the opportunity to present and to thank all the attendees for listening. If you do any further questions that cannot be answered during the Q&A session, please feel free to contact me on the email address there. Great. OK. Well, thank you very much, uh, that's John. That's really appreciated, and uh, thank you for keeping to time. That's even better. And um, we've got uh, we've got one question that's coming forward uh, soon, uh, which affects all three. Um, I just wonder, have we got any particular questions for John at all, Andy? That's come through. Have you got anything before I start? Um, well, uh, any any more come through online? But I I've got a question for you, uh, for you, John. Um, having Chinese owners, did that has that had any effect, or has brought any insights into how you've dealt with the COVID nineteen? Uh, yes, I think there has. Um, I think if you go back maybe three or four weeks before you know the national lockdown kicked in, I. I Personally, I was certainly one of the one of the people that thought that uh, we can't just uh, shut down whole countries and industries. We just can't stop doing it. We're going to have to just get on with it, despite you know what you were seeing in the media. Uh, but they certainly they were certainly bringing over uh, experience because they they were they'd obviously experienced the um, the pandemic before us and were actively encouraging British Steel to to consider different ways of working. So um, there was a, there was an encouragement for anybody that could work from home to start doing that. Um, so we we were we were uh, done. That was done well before the sort of national lockdown came into place. So I think yeah, I think as the as it as it spread across the world, they obviously had the sort of um, the foresight and um, um, they had some experience to sort of share with us, and and that's what they did. Thank you. Yeah, it yeah. seems like we're. we're a masks made compulsory and uh, everything else on on site, or um... they are they are now. Um, I think the initial problem was um, getting hold of them, um, but uh, I think we, we we had some problems uh, initially getting hold of them. But um, they they are now. Uh, if you if you can't social distance, then you must use the the face mask. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. I, I I've got. Um... A question about the COVID side first. Um, are there any activities in in your manufacturing where people have to be very close to each other to do to do this sort of work? And 
can you give us any examples of those that you've had to completely change in terms of the of the processes? I, I think a lot of the operation. I think we're 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 probably fortunate that um, that can either be done um, singularly, you know, one person doing it, or uh, we you know we can segregate people. Uh, there, there was a picture on the slide where there there is a number of um, pulpits. Uh, control rooms where you need at least two people in a in a room which is a confined space and that's where the the rules of um, using the face masks has, has come in okay yeah and then the last question for me before I throw it out open um, is uh, in terms of con continuity of supply because obviously as, as you right as, as everybody has indicated you know this is a critical activity I mean, presumably you were a critical activity, and did did you have you had any interruptions in supply to your main customers? Because you know, at the beginning and in the medium term, while you got these things sorted. I think there was probably uh, leading up to the Easter period, uh, which is obviously a crucial time for Network Rail. We there were some um, uh, rail delivery sites that were were postponed. Uh, but it wasn't a great deal, to be fair, to Network Rail. That they, you know, they really seemed to manage the situation really well, and um, so we've had very little impact really to our supply. Mm. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm just going to throw. I've got a. I've got a, a general question actually, which uh, um, could be regarded as one for me, particularly because I did. I did mention uh, what the PWI was all about. Um, we are all about knowledge sharing um, and that's what we do, we share knowledge but in a lot of cases the knowledge comes from different places and the development of that knowledge does as well and um, particularly innovation and it was an interesting question that we've had from Andrew Thornton is how, how do you manage innovation in a competitive environment and I think, I mean this is an interesting, very very fascinating uh, subject area for us all because we do want companies to share what they do, um, but we are obviously aware that if you're in the supply industry, then you know then there are issues to do with you know competitive advantage and that sort of thing. And I'd like to throw the I'd like to ask uh, Phil that question first of all because I mean you 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 are you are you there Phil? Can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you, Brian. Yeah, Phil, I'm asking you the question first because. I mean, you know, supplier plant is a very competitive industry and you're always looking to, um, you know, to improve what you do. How, how, what's your view? I mean, that's a complicated question, but what's your view on this where you want to share what you're doing with other people, but you obviously got to think about your competitive advantage? Yeah, so, well, the honest answer, Brian, is that... Um, I think we can go so far with sharing innovation and then we 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 protect it to a certain extent uh, and we have examples of that that where we've undertaken that in the past so that might be either a unique piece of plant or even a, a methodology um, and that that's probably the way that we've done it but but generally the sort of routine innovation and working practices uh, no issue with with sharing that throughout the industry yeah, well, thank you for that. Mm. Dominic, can I throw that one home to you? I mean, you've been on the client side, really, for uh, for quite a few years. So you've been dealing with different companies. And I know particularly in your area, I know from a uh, time of been listening to what's been going on in TFL, there's been lots of uh, innovations coming forward. Have you found that, that a barrier to innovation, do you think, this uh, competitive uh, issue? Uh. I wouldn't say no, not really. I, I think I think it's important for us to, to share our, our problems and, and for then the industry, the supplier industry to to hear them so that they can it's giving them sort of uh, food for thought for, for developing developing and innovations. But the issue I found more isn't isn't actually within sort of permanent way. It I mean this is probably maybe a bit a bit specific to me, but it's between the rail industry in when when there's interface issues uh so so the big one for me uh is is regarding sort of squat defects and and defects which are caused by a rolling stock or a traction package issue and 
and there, there just doesn't seem to be much communication between there and whether that's something for this institution, I, I don't know how, but uh, so we've been progressing it within TFL, uh, talking to our, the suppliers of the traction packages, and but they were genuinely surprised when I met with the people that developed the traction package. They were, they were very interested about hearing about these rail defects, but it just it never got through to them, and it's been a it's been a sort of industry issue for well decades now. And, and so, and so I think within the rail industry, I've always been quite pleased about the innovation. Obviously, we can we can improve. But I, I sort of feel that communication with suppliers is quite is quite good in my view. But it's just within the sort of yeah more systems view that I, I feel that's where mm. the, the rail industry sort of struggles a bit. Thank you for that. Can I just call call you in, John? I mean, you're you're an expert in this field because. Uh, you know, you're, you've spent a lot of time in the commercial side in a, a very competitive industry, one could argue the steel industry. What's your view on, on this idea of innovation uh, and, and competitive advantage and knowledge sharing? I think from our side, I think it's um, we're, we're probably a little bit privileged because we, we work with a number of key customers that, 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 that I'd call partners more than customers you know the, the likes of uh, network rail and, and transport for london so we can and it, and it goes back to dominic's point about understanding what the customer's problems are you, you need to start off with that first before you you know you look at sort of the innovation side of it um i, I would also agree with phil in terms of there is a bit of a gray area where you're not quite sure from a commercial side of it <laughs> um and you just need to be protective towards the the work that you're doing you know because nobody wants um when you're putting the work in to develop the innovation then you you know you want the prizes at the end of it as well so it, it is a it is a difficult area sometimes i mean i i prior to you know to the time i've been with the pwi i spent a lot of time looking at innovations in the rail industry and that was always that was always the big issue you spend a lot of development money uh, when I was working for a company and, and looking at what's the best thing you can do and that, that that's very tricky when it comes to going back to selling stuff to to, to supply it to clients I mean um, Andrew Thornton I mean do you want to make a final comment on that you asked you asked the question I'm very open to any any comment from yourself on, on what you've heard from the speakers if you're still there is Andrew is Andrew still here? Does he want to say something? Doesn't seem to be unless his mic's not not got a mic. Um, it's just uh, coming via the chat, Brian, to say that it's a good debate. Oh, <laughs> all right, thank you, Andy. There may there's another question that you want to pose. I think. Yeah, it's come from me in Salisbury, um, who asks, as wearing face masks. Um, caused any problems with people talking to each other? Uh, well, I, I can say we haven't had any issues reported about about communication. Uh, most of both my track techs, you, you could like I don't know, you can muffle them, you still be able to hear them. So uh, I think a, a little face mask, uh, yeah, hasn't ha hasn't had an issue at all. Uh, we haven't heard. Okay. What about you, Phil? Because I mean, that's interesting because people communicating with each other in a tamping environment is difficult anyway, isn't it? It is, Brian. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the uh, equipment that we use is, is sort of noise cancelling, you know, exterior noise cancelling. We also have a lot of throat mics as well uh, that we use on the, um, on the equipment. So again, masks wouldn't necessarily affect comms uh, in that respect but one of the biggest issues we, we've had with face masks is um eye protection misted up when they're wearing the uh, the face masks that seems to be a bigger problem than an effective comms and affecting comms sorry yeah yeah well thank you for that uh, um do you want to say anybody else want to say anything on on face on do you want to say anything on face masks john no, I've, I haven't heard anything. And, um, I think where we where we um, have had to implement the use of face masks, generally the quiet areas, the the control rooms. So it, uh, I don't think communication has been a problem for, from our yeah. side. Well, we've got to thank you for that for those questions. I mean, we're still we've still got a little bit of time left. I, I'm 
and we've still got 30 people here but congratulations to everybody for coming and staying i mean we we had nearly 40 so that's really good and i hope people have enjoyed it i just have i'll just ask one one question um and and i'm going to go around each person each person individually on this one um it's almost like a final question i mean we we've 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 had the covid pandemic and we we're still working our way through it who knows when we'll come out at the end of it but one thing that strikes me is that there has been some health benefits now would you like to go in would you like to tell me what you think any general health benefits or a greater focus on the health of our workforce has been during this crisis do you want to start with start you start john please because you can say that from a i noticed you mentioned quite a lot of in your talk about about health health concerns and and support for your staff um yeah i'm not um I'm not too sure we've uh, what, what health benefits we've seen really. Um, I think you know from the office office staff, I guess uh, not having to commute to work um, does that you know does that allow them to uh, to to do some more exercise um, through the day? Um, I'm not I'm not really sure to be honest, uh, Brian. Well, you said you've got a medical centre. I thought that was. Uh, did you say you that is that a new thing at your place? Oh no, it's 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 been there for a long time. But that, I mean, that's more focused on the, um, uh, you know, the sort of accident emergencies and things like that. But it, but it does also, you know, it it does look at the, um, it does also cover the mental health side of things. So it, that's that was the, yeah, that was the main point. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking that Dominic, do you want to comment on general health of staff? Yeah, well, like, like I mentioned, I think we're going to site and just uh, leaving from site and not going back to the depot. Uh, well, but I think that's just sort of cut a bit of time off a shift, which you could argue added added little benefit. Uh, so I think that's been good. I, I do also think the communication uh, has maybe been been a bit better because previously we relied on, which I still think is valuable. And I do miss just the sort of general discussions you have around the depot and, that, and that's gone I, I i almost feel that's a shame but i also feel that now our communication was it's, it's like digital is virtual it has actually been a bit i think we're communicating better especially regarding our planning because we're a bit less informal we're a bit more formal so i think i think if we talk, it's not really a health improvement but it's, it's been a, a you could argue it's been a positive of, of how we're working now but uh, in terms of our planning, we've had to be a bit a bit more formal. So, so that that's been that's been a, a benefit. I mean, we are we are. Thank you very much, Dominic, for that. I mean, it, it is, you know, it is a people industry working and communication and health and looking after each other and doing things efficiently. And and it just seemed to me that the general message I've been getting on all these spoke events has been very much about a real basis of people working together better. Uh, Alan, uh, sorry, Phil. Do you want to do you want to add something from SB on health? Yeah, from from an SB perspective, Brian. So we've obviously uh, in the um, weekly briefs that we pushed out, we've included healthy choices guidance um, quite frequently. Also, uh, the other week, aligning with Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, we obviously highlighted the the issue surrounding mental health because I think that is. Uh, potentially a big problem that, that we're going to face over the next uh, few months. Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, I've had the cycle down from the brackets in the garage for the first time in a number of months. <laughs> and I've right enjoyed going out certainly this time of year. Um, so it's certainly benefited me, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. That's really good to hear. We want, we're, all, we're looking at the health of all our people. Health and welfare yeah. is really important for us all. Um, we just had a message in from uh, our, our, our questioner, which was um, Andrew um, asking about the competition thing. And he just said that, that uh, sometimes competition regulate, regulators seem quite far removed from track practical engineering issues. And, and I think that's right. But we've, got, we've just got to be very professional about how we do things, but we should never hide stuff away in my view for to, to stop innovation um andy is there any final things you'd like to say before we close no i think i've uh, yeah i've just i'd just like to thank all the speakers for uh, three uh, 
really good presentations, very informative. Thank you. Well, Andy's done a lot of work on this, so please, if you didn't catch the first two, please look at them because I, I, I'm just really impressed by by all, all the presentations that we've had so far. So on that on that note, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank thank you to our speakers. Um, and uh, I just want a quick word with Phil. So, Phil, if you could just stay online for a minute at the end, that'd be really helpful. But on behalf of the PWI, thank you, everybody, and keep safe and keep well. Thank you very much. I'll give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.